So this week, week two, the, I've titled this, What are the Odds? Because as we read through in just a second, chapter two, what I want you to wrestle with is, what are the odds? What are the odds that these things could happen? That all of these events could just kind of come together like they've come together. What are the odds? Is it just happenstance? Is it just luck, fate, kismet, karma? What are the odds? Well, here's our definition this morning for providence. This is from A.W. Pink, one of my favorite authors. He says, the providence of God is his care of and provision he makes for his creatures. That includes you. That includes me. Nothing is more strengthening to faith, stabilizing to the mind, tranquilizing to the heart of a Christian than for him to be enabled to discern his father's hand, guiding, shaping, and controlling everything that enters his life. And not only so, but that he is also governing this world and all people and events in it. Again, pretty wordy definition, but I think all A.W. Pink's trying to tell us is that we should gain confidence, peace, strength, comfort from the fact that our God is in control, involved, aware, and working all things for our good every day in every situation. Whether we get it, understand it, like it, recognize it, the, the goal is to start recognizing it, that there's God. That was a God thing. And to be able to thank God for what he's doing in your life. But the, the, the key phrase here for me is that enabled to discern his father's hand. That's my goal for this study is that we, myself included, would learn and be enabled to discern God's hand in my life and in your life and in the lives of those around us. Instead of just responding, crap, how'd that happen? Man, that's a bummer. That stinks. Glad I'm not him. Why'd that have to happen to me? In, in other words, you, you learn to start seeing things a little bit differently through the eyes of God rather than the eyes of the world or your own eyes. So this idea of seeing the Father's hand, discerning the Father's hand in the everyday affairs of life is huge. He goes on in the same book and he says, God is not troubled by anything that is now taking place in his world. Are you? Well, I'm not God. Well, you believe in God. You're a son of God. You say you trust God. Well, God's not worried. Why am I worried? Why are you worried? He's not worried either in its political, social, or religious sphere, nor should we be. The helm is in his hand. Now, I hope you see that that kind of a belief, that definition, if we embrace it, if we believe it, will change the way we view the affairs of life, the, the things that take place in life. Politics, for instance, if God's in control, if God has the helm firmly in his hand, we can trust him. That doesn't mean everything's going to go right. That doesn't mean the, mean the next four years is going to be um, a wonderful time here in the United States. It, it doesn't guarantee anything of that nature. It just guarantees that whatever happens, our God is in control, not troubled, not worried, not caught off guard, not up in heaven wringing his hands going, how in the world did this happen? And it will change how you view life, how you handle the affairs of life. So let's read chapter two. This story is going to get better and better as we read along. Better being an, probably an inappropriate term to describe it, but it, it gets more interesting. I can give you that. So chapter two, verse one, you can read it on page 23. If you want to use the same version I'm reading from the ESV, it says, after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, now remember he had, he had, uh, had a, a 187 day binge party, feast, festival, drinking, wine, food, and at the end of it, he invited his wife, well, he commanded his queen, Queen Vashti, to come before him. He wanted to parade her before all of his drunken guests. She refused. He goes to his advisors. They say, get rid of her, fire her, make an example of her. He's, I think, well, the text tells us he was merry with wine after 100, 187 days. He agrees with them. It pleases him. He fires her. Now, here's the after effect. Everybody wakes up, right? Everybody has to sober up at some point. Well, he sobers up. 
When the anger of the king Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. He's the one who decreed it. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Now, what, what it doesn't say here, but I think is inferred is that he remembered what he did and what he had decreed, and I think he regretted it. Oops, I did something really stupid. I just got rid of probably the most beautiful woman in the kingdom. And his young men sense it, and so they come to him, and they come up with this great idea. Now, all of us would love to have advisors like this, right? <laughs> let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And I love this next line. It's such an understatement. This pleased the king, and he did so. What? What red-blooded American male or Persian male would not, not be pleased by that suggestion? Yeah, gather every good-looking woman in the country and bring her here, and you choose the one you want. Now there was a Jew in Susa. One of the things I want you to do as we read through this, look for all the, the words that have to do with time, references to time, like when, after, now. There's a ton of them, and I think it's critical to the passage. Now there was in Susa a Jew... In the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shemai, son of Kish, a Benjamite, that's going to become important as we move along, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. In other words, he, he was part of the dispersion. He was part of the group that got uh, taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar when he took over Judah. So it goes on. He was bringing up Hadassah. That is Esther, Hadassah being her Persian name, Esther being her uh, Hebrew name, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was young, a young woman, the young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. He adopts her. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. That's going to come up again. So here she is. She's a Jew. She's been adopted by her cousin. She's living with him. The edict goes out. Everybody's gathered. They didn't seem to just gather Persians. They gathered Persians, Jews, anybody who lived in the kingdom who was female, single, virgin, and it was good looking. They just took them all. And she was taken up in the mix. He quickly provided her with cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai, her cousin, had commanded her not to make it known. In other words, she didn't let anybody know, including Haggai the eunuch and the king, that she was a Jew. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices, and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. Most commentators believe what this is saying is that what she took with her was something to help please the king sexually, okay? Um, here, here's what I want you to wrestle with as you read this story. And we kind of talked about, about this last week. Do not make Esther a heroine. Don't make Esther into this icon of virtue because what, what is about to happen in this story that we sometimes read and gloss over is that Esther is going to go into the king to do what? Play chess? <laughs> Discuss a book? Hey, have you read this book? It's really good. You want to watch a movie? No. She's going into the king to satisfy him sexually. Now, I already know. What do we know about Ahasuerus? This guy can party with the best of them. I think he is uh, a guy who is obsessed with pleasure. 
He's, he's, got, he's bringing all these women in, putting them in his harem. And here's what the reality is. Esther's going to win this contest. It doesn't tell us how she won it, but it's pretty clear that she won it because she pleased the king more than all the others. What happened to all the other girls who lost? Did they go back home? No, they stayed in the harem. What was their job in the harem? To go please the king whenever he wanted one of them. See, this guy wasn't choosing one. He was choosing many. She just happened to be the favorite. She became the queen, but he had a whole harem full of other women. He used whenever he wanted. There's sexual references all throughout this passage. And yet she's a Jew. And she's not supposed to marry outside the Jewish faith. So there's all kinds of stuff going on in this passage that are really uncomfortable if you start digging. So she goes in. Well, it goes on. It says, in the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return, talking about any of the women who were going in to please the king. She would go back to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again, unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. So the, the, basically, the, the scenario is this is a contest of sorts where the king, night after night, has a different concubine, a different woman brought in, a virgin, young girl, has sex with her, sends her back. Next night, it's a new one. If he liked that one, he'd bring her back again. But he's, he's making a decision, a decision to find a, a queen, a decision I would think he would put off for quite some time <laughs> just because it's a fairly fun contest for him. But that's not what's going to happen. When the turn came for Esther, this is where it gets important, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charged the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, which this is a change of scene here. Esther has not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh... We heard their names in chapter 1. Two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And when the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Whew. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on in this chapter, right? <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of different things. We're, we're introduced to two new characters, okay? Esther and her cousin Mordecai, both Jews, both living in Persia. Esther gets swept up into this edict that's bringing in all these women to try out to be the new queen. Um, Mordecai, we're going to find out, is actually sitting at the king's gate, and we'll discover what that really means. But you, you've got these two new characters introduced after chapter one. Chapter one was all about who? King Ahasuerus, powerful, wealthy, influential, to be feared. And now here come these two unknown kind of just nobodies, Mordecai and Esther. But their life is going to be radically changed. And as I said, as we read through this, if you look for all the references to time, like now, when, then, after, there's a ton of them. And it starts out in verse 1, after these things. Chapter 2 is going to kind of produce a whole bunch of coincidences. Things that just kind of happen. She gets chosen. You know, the edict gets announced, she gets chosen, she ends up in the harem, Mordecai's at the king's gate, he just happens to be there when these two guys plot the king's assassin. All these, all these coincidences are taking place. But there's a huge emphasis on timeliness. 
and then, at this time, when, over and over again, you see these words, and it's trying to let you know something is happening behind the scenes. After the setup of chapter 1, now some things are beginning to kind of spin into place. Verse 5 says, there was a Jew. Now, there were a lot of Jews living in Persia at this time. Many, most of the Jews never returned to the land of Canaan, the, the promised land. They never went back under Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel. They stayed in Persia. But it says, now there was a Jew, a Jew in Susa, whose name was Mordecai. And as, I, as we read just a second ago, he was a Benjamite. And that's going to become very, very important as we move through the story. He's bringing up Esther, his cousin, whose parents happened to die. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So all these things are starting to fall into place. She was beautiful, lovely. Isn't that interesting? She could have been ugly, but she wouldn't have been chosen had she had been ugly. She was beautiful. And the king's order and his edict was proclaimed. And, and then it goes, when the time came, when the turn came for each of these women, all these, we don't know how many women were chosen, but it was probably in the hundreds, if not thousands, we don't know. But each one of them got their chance to go into the king. And when it came time for her, that's important. Because one after the other, these women are coming in and every one of them, guess what, wants to be queen. And I think the reference to they took things with them, I think they were going overboard to, to find things to please the king, whether it was what they wore, what they brought with them, things to pleasure him, please him, whatever it was, everybody's competing to become queen. And the king's got a hard decision to make. And as I said, I think he's going to prolong it as long as he can. When the turn came for Esther, she goes in. We're not told what happens, but you don't have to. Well, don't use your imagination. Okay, just don't go there. But you know something happened. She went into the king, and they didn't play chess. And the king loved her more than all the others. Immediately, it seems to infer. She goes into the king. And, and basically, I don't know how many were before her and how many were after her, but he basically stopped the contest and said, you're it. You're the one. She found favor. She pleased him. And then he gave a huge feast in her honor. He chose the queen. Now think about that. It just so happened, Esther's parents die. Her cousin Mordecai adopts her. The king has a feast for 187 days. He comes up with an edict, he fires his queen, he's recommended to have this beauty contest, for lack of a better term, and Esther, this unknown Jewish girl, gets sucked up into the whirlwind of that, she gets chosen to be queen, and her cousin is there nearby, and we're going to see he's more than nearby, he's at the king's gate. All of this is not just coincidence. There's something going on behind the scenes, right? There's, there's some planning going on that th this is not just kind of happening. There's, there's a plan in place that someone is working, and it's all coming together in a seamless fashion. Now, you could read this and, and not say that and not reach that conclusion, and, and you could read this and just go, well... Hey, what an interesting story. Isn't that interesting how that all came to place? What a lucky girl she is. Well, really, as a Jewish girl, it's, she's not really lucky at all. Because she is violating a number of Jewish commands and laws of God that she should not be doing. Eating the king's food. Associating with pagans. Having premarital sex with a pagan, and then ultimately marrying this pagan. All, all these things are against the, the law of God, and yet here she is. And while there's a seeming randomness to all of this, it ain't, it ain't random at all. And again, I've, I've read the story, and hopefully you've read the story, and you can make that same conclusion. But have you not read the story, you're going you're gonna to find out as we move through this, there's, there's no randomness in any of this. What appears to be randomness is actually 
the sovereign hand of God planning and moving everything along. But again, as the title of this lesson is, what are the odds? What are the odds of all this happening? I'm not a gambler. I don't even understand odds and how they, they do all that. But I'm, I, I'm smart enough to know that the odds for all this happening is really, really high. It, it's just impossible. It, it's off the charts impossible for all these things to just happen. Happenstance, luck, fate, kismet, karma, whatever you want to call it, God is in, involved. And so you got Esther, you got Mordecai, who is this guy? We don't know a lot about Mordecai other than that he's a Jew living in Persia. He's part of the diaspora. He's part of that group who was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. And then the Babylonians got defeated by the Persians. And so he ends up living in, under Persian rule. But one of the key things is that he's a Benjamite, Benjaminite. Uh, he's of the family, the clan of Benjamin. And, and that'll come uh, next week. We'll talk more about that. But that's critical to the equation. As we said, he's raising Esther, his cousin. He's adopted her. She just happens to be beautiful. Isn't that kind of interesting? It says she was young, had a beautiful figure, and was lovely to look at. Okay? That's, that's important to the story. Uh, she was a gorgeous young lady. We don't know how old she was. She could have been as young as 13. We don't know what the cutoff. There may not have been a cutoff in terms of age range. Verses 3 and 4 says, Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem and Susa, the citadel. Let the young woman who pleased the king be queen instead of Vashti. She was beautiful. She was chosen. And she actually gets chosen to be the queen. He loved her. He fell in love with her. First blush. She's, she's the one. Is that just the choice of a drunken king still trying to sober up from 187 days of partying? Or could that be the hand of God moving things along the way he wants them to move along? Remember, chapter one was all about the sovereignty, the control, the power of a man. Now we're seeing, moving into the story, we're seeing the power and the control of an invisible God orchestrating things in a way to make this story make sense. So the king loved Esther more than all the others, all the other virgins. Why? We're not told what he loved about her. We're not told what she did, how she pleased him. I'm glad it doesn't go into graphic detail, but he loved her. She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he puts the crown on her head. He makes her the queen of Persia. Do you get how incredibly important, significant, bizarre that statement is that this young Jewish girl who's a nobody, who just happened to be beautiful, who happened to be living in this country, not as a guest, but more like a prisoner, is made the next queen of the most powerful country in the world at that time. It's incredible. It's, it's amazing. Out of all the choices, she gets chosen, and she happens to be a Jew. Now, remember, how, how big was this kingdom? It went all the way from uh, India all the way to Ethiopia, 127 provinces. I guarantee his harem was full of women of every color, stripe, nationality. And who did he choose? A Jew. An unknown, obscure young woman who had been adopted by her cousin. So... Then he tells us about Mordecai. Why is Mordecai important to this story? Well, Mordecai is the one who adopted this woman to begin with. Mordecai has a place sitting at the king's gate. Now, what that means, guys, is that he had a job. Sitting at the king's gate was not like going sitting at the barbershop, you know, just hanging out at the barbershop or going to Starbucks and hanging out with your buddies. Sitting at the king's gate had significance in the context of Persia, even in Israel, in the Middle East at that time, it was rank and privilege. It meant he had a job sitting at the king's gate. The king's gate was where all transactions were done. All law was conducted. Judgments were done at the king's gate. Business was done at the king's gate. So he had a job. He had a position of authority sitting at the king's gate. He wasn't hanging out like he didn't have a job. 
That's the way I used to read this, is that, you know, he was hanging out at the gate. It just happened to be there. No, he had a job. He was an official. I think he was on the royal payroll. I think the king, because he oversaw so many different provinces, so many different uh, nationalities, that he had men who sat at the gate who represented all the different countries over which he ruled. Mordecai happened to be one of them. He's sitting at the king's gate. Isn't that interesting? Mordecai just happens to be on the king's payroll. He's got access. He can go there. He can, he can hang out and be close to his cousin who's now going to become the queen. And it happens that in verse 21, in those days, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate and these two guys who we read about in chapter 1, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, in other words, kept people from getting close to the king, they start plotting. Who happens to be sitting there? Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew. We don't know the nationalities of the, these two guys, but they're not Jews. They're probably speaking a language they think he doesn't know. They feel kind of free to talk in front of him or nearby him. He overhears them, and he just so happens to be there when they plot the king's assassination, which he then reports to, queen, to the queen, Esther, who then reports it to the king. And when they look into it, they discover it. They prove it's true. They kill these two guys. And this is critical. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Don't let that sentence leave your brain. Because we're going to come back to it in the weeks ahead. So what happens? Mordecai, here's the threat. Here's the plotting. Reveals it to Esther, his cousin who's now become queen. She tells the king. The king kills the two men and has it written in a book that records all the stuff that happens around the king. No more said. Nothing happens for Mordecai. He doesn't get a reward. He's not promoted in any way. He's not recognized in any way. Is all of this just good luck? At this point, we don't even know. This, this doesn't even sound like it did anything for Mordecai. He just happened to expose something, and those two guys get killed, and life goes on for Mordecai. Is it a case of being in the right place at the right time? Boy, wasn't it fortunate that I was sitting there at the king's gate, overheard these two, two guys, and they were going to plot to kill the king. And I was able to save the king's life by telling Esther, who then told him. And it just so happened that Esther is my cousin, and she just happened to be crowned queen. And see, see all this, it's just not happenstance. And if you're a believer, and this was written for Jews, they were the audience who read this letter, who read this book. They would read that and go, that's, that's God. That's got to be God. A third grader, a Hebrew third grader would read that and go, that's God. God's doing that. Even though his name's never mentioned in the book, they would have read it and known God's in the book. We need to read it and go, that's God. All of this is God. God is at work. And I want to go back to, we read this passage last week. These are the words of Mary. When she was told she was going to have Jesus Christ, the Messiah, she's a virgin who's pregnant, and she, she responds, and listen to what she says. The mighty one is holy, God, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones, and he has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. This is Mary, a young virgin girl who's become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which is going to lead to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. This is her view of that event. We've got another young virgin girl. Well, no longer a virgin girl. She started out as one, but she's now living in a pagan land. She's now the queen. And she and Mordecai are going to see the hand of the mighty one, God Almighty, step into the world, step into their life, and do some incredible things and bring down a prince. And we're getting ahead of the story, but all of this is the hand of God. This is the sovereignty of God. And guys, I know that's probably um, a no-brainer for most of us in the room. At least I hope it is. You're going to get tired of hearing me saying it, that God is in control and God is at work behind the scenes. But here's my fear for many of us in the room, and it's one I have of myself, is that too often in my life and too often in your life, we don't see God at work. And we look at these things and we, we, 
we reach certain conclusions based on what's happened. So if something negative happens in your life or to someone near you or close to you, something negative happens, we look at that and go, there's no way that can be good. There's no way that can be the hand of God. God would never let that happen. And if something good happens in your life, you get a promotion, you get a bonus, maybe you, your adult daughter has a grandson is born and you, you know, you're just so excited. Even that we don't necessarily give God credit for. It's just the way life is. They got married, they loved each other, they got pregnant, they had a baby, isn't it wonderful? And we may thank God and we may say, thanks for having a healthy baby. But we don't really see the hand of God working behind the scenes, orchestrating things in such a way that what does he have in store for that baby? What's he got in store for that family? What, what's, what's the role he has for you in all of that? See, we've got to learn to see God at work behind the scenes in ways that are sometimes miraculous, sometimes not miraculous. He's just there. And, 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 and to be able to look at our lives and go, what are the odds that that happened the way it happened, when it happened, and involved the people it happened to? What are the odds? Well, the odds are probably pretty stacked against you that unless God was involved, that it would have happened at all. And that's true of the good. That's true of the bad. And there are many guys in this room who, if given the opportunity, could testify to the fact that they've had things happen in their lives that at first blush they looked at it and went, there is no way under God's glory and grace that that was a good thing that happened to me. And yet, as they look back on their lives, they realize that, you know what, that was God. Guys, I have, I have been fired from jobs, fortunately not this one yet. I have um, been on the verge of bankruptcy multiple times with past businesses I own. I have, um, I've had heart, heartache, hurt. I've lost loved ones to death. And, and in the midst of those, I typically look at them and go, thanks a lot, God. I don't know where you were. I don't know what you were thinking, but this stinks. But given enough time, and as I grow in my knowledge and understanding of God, I've been able to look back and go, man, losing that job was the best thing that ever happened to me. Reaching the point of bankruptcy where I lost everything and what, I owed more money than I could ever make. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Now, would I, would I raise my hand and ask God to let it happen again? Not on your life. But I know that if it does happen again, I know now that, you know what? There's no reason I should panic because my God's in control and he's going to bring good out of this somehow. Will it hurt? Yes. Will I suffer? More than likely. But I will grow. And that's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. So here are your three questions for this morning. I know you love this part because every guy in this room loves to talk. And every guy in this room loves to open up and share their heart. So this is your chance. Do you think Esther and Mordecai were wrong for agreeing to let her be placed in the king's harem? Now you may think, well, I never thought about it. Well, think about it. Were they wrong? Because again, what are they doing? They're Jews and they're basically saying, Hey, the king's taking all these women, go. You're going to eat the king's food. You're going to violate the commands of God. You're going to end up having sex with a pagan. You're going to end up marrying a pagan. Go ahead. It doesn't matter. Were they wrong? And what I'm trying to get you to wrestle with is that, is that sometimes things are going to happen in your life where you did something wrong or you violated the will of God, the command of God, and yet God's going to use that to accomplish his will in your life. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? If becoming part of the harem meant Esther had to sin by having sex outside of marriage with a non-Jew, was this the will of God? Now, you may not reach an answer. You may, you may around the table have differences of opinion. Just don't fight. Don't punch each other. Just have differences of opinion. But I want you to wrestle with these things because this is part of dealing with the providence of God. Thirdly, how can God be in control and sovereign over all and yet not treat us as machines, dictating our every move? You know, there's, there's, a, there's a chance that you could step away from this and go, well, if God's sovereign, 
What's it matter? He's going to work it all out anyway. So I'm just going to live my life and have fun. Where does your responsibility lie? Even though God's in control, do you have some responsibility? Did Esther have responsibility? Did Mordecai have responsibility? See, if you compare this story, and we kind of talked about it last week, if you compare this story to that of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go, if you take those guys who were living in Babylon, they were living in the king's palace, they were eating the king's food, but refused to eat the king's food. They said, no, we won't. They refused to bow down to the king's idols. They kept their integrity, and they ended up being thrown into the fiery furnace or thrown into the lion's den, but yet God saved them. So you don't see this in the story. Esther didn't go, hey, hey, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I, can't, I can't go into the king's harem. She may have lost her life. But she may have also seen God spare her life. We don't, we don't know because that's not what happened. So I want you to wrestle with these things, guys, because as you go through life, just like this young man who lost his life this last week in this tragic car accident, what role did he play? What role did God play? What responsibility do, do we have in all of this? So again, you may get through one of these. You may get stuck on the second one, the third one, but just... Wrestle your way through it as we continue to work through the providence of God. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for these guys. Thank you for this tough topic because it's forcing us, Father, it's definitely forcing me to wrestle with what I believe about you and your control and your will and your power, your sovereignty, and how you care about me. You care about every aspect of my life, and there are parts of my life, Father, even right now that I'm not real happy with. I don't like the way they're going, and yet i got to trust that you know what you're doing and that you're going to work all things together for my good. But, Father, help me to understand that the definition of what is good is not my definition. It's your definition. You know what's best, not me. And so, Father, while I would like to see the trials of life all removed, you may choose not to do that. You may bring them for the very purpose of accomplishing your will in my life and the will of your will for those around my life. So, Father, bless the time around the tables. Open up the hearts, the mouths of the guys and help them to share openly and honestly. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.